So we will go today through two-dimensional NMR spectroscopy, which is what is mostly used when it comes to a big molecule. Big meaning more than 20 protons or 20 carbons or thereabouts. You will see if you look at the PDB database that a couple of tens of thousands of protein structures have by now been determined using just NMR spectroscopy. This is for situations when they don't crystallize or don't fold or in various ways resist attempts at structure determination using other methods. So we will look today at how all of those things work. But firstly, we need to clear a fundamental hurdle, and this is about how to record NMR data with multiple time coordinates. So item one, philosophy really, um, multiple time coordinates. You've been around this little universe of ours for nearly 20 years, all of you. Uh, you would, of course, um, remember that we've got this minor inconvenience. We only have one time coordinate in this universe. And so this presents a certain logistical difficulty. But let us first think about why we would like to have multiple time coordinates. If we look at our magnetization, for example, mu x, as a function of time, we are going to have some kind of oscillation for every nucleus that we have in the NMR system. So this function here would be f of t is some coefficient a magnitude e pi omega t, where omega is the Larmor frequency of our nucleus. And then, of course, a Fourier transform, then once we do it, Ft, this will be the amplitude and this will be the frequency. We are going to have a single peak. And we've done it, so it's omega naught, and let's put a naught into here. We've done that both in your mathematics modules and in your magnetic resonance course. Uh, I think actually you've seen it a few times by now in various other spectroscopies. That is the common relationship between um, the pulse and the frequency response of any linear time invariant system, including spin systems. The trouble with this is as soon as we've got a few dozen spins, this becomes quite crowded. I have an example for you in the handout for a mixture, in this case ethyl benzene and cholesterol, but in any, for example, metabolic NMR experiments, you will have thousands of substances with tens of thousands of peaks in there. Things overlap severely. It's not possible to tell what is what. The usefulness of NMR spectroscopy diminishes. Likewise, for proteins, if we put something like ubiquitin, you know, a few dozen amino acids in there, a few hundred magnetic nuclei, again, they overlap so much that you cannot tell what is what. Consider, however, an extension of this where we would hypothetically have f of t1 and t2, some amplitude e i omega 1 t1, e i omega 2 t2. So a hypothetical experiment in which the first spin with Larmor frequency omega 1 evolves in time t1 and the second one evolves with time t2. What we are going to have in the time domain in that case is two time coordinates. So I will draw it like that. So if that is our t2 and that is our t1 and that is our amplitude, then we begin at some value of the initial magnetization. So say here we have the starting point and it begins to oscillate and oscillates somehow and goes with respect to time t2. Then 
it would also oscillate in time t1, so we would have some kind of variation in the initial points here in this a t1 plane and then if we let it evolve in time t2 it would likewise move so something like that and you would have a two-dimensional oscillation then and so on and so forth so we are going to have a matrix at the end of this that is a matrix with two time coordinates in it. Then, of course, we can easily extend the Fourier transform to handle multiple time coordinates if we simply just apply two transforms sequentially. f of omega 1 and omega 2 would be 1 over 2 pi, so remember root 2 pi, but twice integral, in this case from 0 to infinity d t1 integral from 0 to infinity dt2 all of that applied to our f of t1 t2 e minus i omega 1 t1 e minus i omega 2 t2 and that's just a simple extension to two dimensions one integral after the other and I've used operator notation here for integration right this simply means integrate whatever occurs in front with respect to t2 and then integrate it with respect to t1 what is going to happen as a result of this is we are going to have once again a peak but the peak is going to be in two dimensions we will have frequency omega 1 here frequency omega 2 here. Our first spin is at omega 1, the second spins at omega 2. So let's say here somewhere is the frequency of our first spin, here somewhere is the frequency of our second spin, and we are going to have, and we are looking at it from the top, a peak in two dimensions. If we have more spins in the system, with different chemical shifts, we might have a peak here. We didn't necessarily have the same width in the two dimensions, and perhaps a peak there. And in a 2D spectrum, there are two extra advantages that we have. Firstly, the peaks would be better separated in two dimensions than they had been in one, and secondly, if we manage to link these two frequencies, for example, two spins have a J-coupling, we allow them to evolve on one spin for a while, move it to the next spin through the J-coupling, allow it to evolve for another time for a while. This would only lead to observable magnetization if the two spins are J-coupled. And so these peaks, they're called cross peaks, would highlight to us which nuclei are nearby in the molecule in either the topological sense through the J-couplings or in spatial proximity sense if we manage to use nuclear overhauser effects that we have discussed in the previous lecture. Okay, so of course all of that did not remove the fundamental trouble that we have is, uh, you know, hypothesized as we might here, we still only have one temporal dimension. How can we do that? Well, of course, nothing prevents us from running an experiment multiple times. Let us try and put something together like this. This is our pulse sequence and this is the time coordinate. We would have some preparation period, so prep, which may involve just a 90 degrees pulse to make some magnetization transverse. Then we can wait for a time t1, then do some moves uh, or mixes, um, so it's called the mixing period, the other name for it, and then detect. And that's the time t2. Uh, 
Well, detection, of course, is a real-time activity. So once we made some magnetization transverse and it started processing and inducing current in our detection coil, we really need to do this in real time. So T2 is um, non-negotiably a real-time um, period. However, T1 can just be incremented. Why don't we just run multiple experiments? In the first experiment, we will have T1 equal to zero. So very short, and that's number one. In the second experiment, entirely different experiment, we just let the system fully relax, recover, come back to where it is, the equilibrium magnetization, and then run another experiment with a somewhat longer period T1, and then another experiment with a, a longer period still, and so on. So we simply run and experiments forward with different values of T1. And then we have K points here. What of course is then going to happen every time we record this free induction decay, we get a vector. Then we do another experiment with a different value of T1. That's another vector and another vector and another vector. We just put them into a matrix. And so this is our dimension k and this is our dimension n we are going to have it so we do not need to have two real time directions we can have one indirectly incremented of course this will increase the experiment time but who cares we can leave it running overnight and this was the original idea in 1971 i think by jean genere which has opened um, floodgate really uh, and a lot of two-dimensional and three-dimensional and four-dimensional experiments have emerged in the basic case this could be just a 90 degrees pulse and so our spin is going to evolve with some frequency omega 1 then this move could be just an inept experiment. Remember coherence transfer we did when we did product operator formalism. We can just move that magnetization to a nearby spin, at which point during T2 it's going to evolve with a different frequency omega 2. And poof, we have accomplished our objective. In this time it evolves with omega 1, in this time it evolves with omega 2. We can then see which omega 1s are connected to which omega 2s. This is our structural information about what is J coupled to what or what is physically proximate to what. Okay, so now that we've got the fundamentals out of the way, item 2 on the agenda is to take a look at the specifics. So H, M, Q, C, and H, S, Q, C experiments. Heteronuclear multiple quantum coherence, heteronuclear single quantum coherence. It will become clear what they are and why they're called this way once we consider the pulse sequences. Okay, H, M, Q, C. Let us take a look at protons and at, for example, 15N in a protein. So we have our proton channel, we have our nitrogen channel. Uh, what we're going to do is do a 90 degrees. So I'll transition to the notation that is closer to what you would see on an oscilloscope. If you plug uh, the output of your waveform synthesis to a scope, it will just be a very, very, very rapid oscillation. Uh, and there will be a few of them in time. So this will be a pi by 2x. Then we wait for a period tau over 2. Tau being the usual J-coupling evolution delay. Then we do a 90 here. on the nitrogen and again that's pi by 2x then we do the first half uh, 
of the T1 period, so the indirect evolution period, then we do a pi, and that's the Y phase, so pi Y on the protons. Then we do the second half of the T1 period, and finally we have another 90 on the nitrogen, so pi half here in minus x phase. We wait for another tau half and we record protons. So free induction decay on the protons here. Okay, rather a lot to take in and we will not go through the details of the product operator formalism treatment uh, for lack of time, even though we could. Let us just think about what is happening here. So, stages. We begin with the longitudinal magnetization on the protons. So, Hz, then pi by 2 in the x phase is going to take us to minus Hy. Then we have the tau over 2 period. Remember what tau period was accomplishing in a J-coupled system. It was moving magnetization from just the pure transverse spin state on one spin to a two-spin order. Right? And tau over 2 would take us to 2 h, x, and z. Yeah, so now we are correlated to the nitrogen. And this is at the end of this tau over 2. Then pi by 2 x will move the nitrogen into the transverse plane. So the next stage here will get us to h, x, and y. And uh, I will stop tracking the minus signs in here. Uh, basically because A we don't care and B the magnetogyric ratios of nitrogen and proton are actually opposite and so there'll be no end to confusion um, if we start tracking them and then looking at carbon-13 for example. Okay, now what is this H, X and Y? Remember what H, X had been. Uh, H, X is H plus plus H minus over 2. Likewise, and y is n plus minus n minus over 2i. The reverse relations to the definitions of raising and lowering operators. If we put that and that here, we are going to have things like h plus n plus, h plus n minus, and so on. These are zero and double quantum coherences between these two spins. So they are multiple quantum coherences. And if we have more than two spins in the system, J coupled, we will have three spin orders, four spin orders, and so on, accumulating within that system. Then, okay, this takes us to the start of the indirect evolution period. But notice what is happening here. We have some evolution, then a refocusing pulse on the protons, and then some further evolution. What this is going to do is this state is transverse in both the protons and the nitrogens. It will begin to evolve with both frequencies. However, in the middle, there's a refocusing pulse on the protons. So that will refocus the protons and they'll recollect back. So effectively, the evolution would only happen on the nitrogen. So the next stage here, therefore, is we will have two H, X, and Y. Simplifying somewhat, there would be further terms in there, but E, I, omega, N, 
in one at the end of this evolution period. In practice, of course, the instrument would not be able to directly detect a complex number. It would detect the cause and the sign, so separate experiments are needed and then they are combined into a complex number. But in a simplified picture, what this stage is simply going to do is it will, as we say, frequency label the nitrogen. We will be evolving in T1 with the frequency omega n. Then, okay, what we now have here is the pulse that puts the nitrogen back where it had been. That is the z-axis. So we have Ny. We now have the pulse that turns it back. So we are going to have 2hxnz. But of course, this coefficient still lives i omega n t1. And then the final tau 2 period, remember the wheel of the two spin orders and one spin orders under the J coupling. The wheel will eventually turn and get us back where we came from minus hy, and then e i omega n t1 is still there. So this takes us to this period, the start of the detection period, and that is t2. But now, of course, this is entirely proton magnetization. And so when it begins to evolve, we want to now destroy the nitrogen-15 interactions. And so a decoupling is applied here which essentially is blasting the nitrogen-15 with so, such a strong radio frequency field that it begins to turn much faster than the J-coupling. And that effectively, in the effective Hamiltonian, puts the J-coupling to zero. So when this begins to evolve, it evolves with just the proton frequency. Uh, once again, simplifying somewhat in practice, this is sign and cos, but they can always be recombined into the complex number h y e i omega n t1 e i omega h t2 and finally uh, at the detection right we record the observable operator and uh, this in this case is proton magnetization so our free induction decay t1 t2 is going to be some amplitude so proportional really not equal to e i omega n t1 e i omega h t2 and of course this is exactly what we wanted in our philosophy discussion here we are going to have that two-dimensional spectrum once we do the Fourier transform so Fourier transform and then we are done so uh, the illustration for this is in your handout and this is an HMQC spectrum of strychnine uh, the terrible poison as you can see there in both the proton dimension this is a, a proton carbon spectrum and carbon dimension there would have been significant crowding and overlap if we were to record a 1d Right. There are multiple signals with the same chemical shift for both the protons and the carbons. But once we've separated it out in two dimensions, firstly, we can see the signals individually, and secondly, we now know which proton is J-coupled to which carbon here. And of course, we can lengthen or shorten this period tau 2 to allow, if it's very short, only the strongest J-couplings to manifest, so this would be the near-range experiment, or if we make it very long, even the weak J-coupling will have the time to kick in, and so we would see further, and there will be further cross-picks in there, and these are the games that organic chemists are playing every time they've synthesized something new, and they want to confirm that that's in fact what they want to the complication here is in the nature of these multiple quantum coherences. You will notice in the handout, although it's an improvement, we have well-separated peaks, the multiplicity there is quite messy. Uh, 
right? You can see that the signals are hard to quantify, hard to fit, hard to decide which actual chemical shift they have because they are such a mess. And this is the consequence of the fact that, of course, it's not just a two-spin system. There are multiple interacting spins with multiple J couplings. And so the actual complexity of the calculation is rather greater, which is why I've only given you a schematic. A way to fix that is called HSQC. And that is an experiment where very specifically through careful choice of pulse phases, gradients, and other things I will not go into the details of, we only keep single quantum coherences in the experiment so that the multiplicity patterns in our 2D spectrum are significantly simplified. And that, spec that pulse sequence is even easier to understand because you will see familiar patterns there. If this is our proton channel and that's our nitrogen channel, then the first stage really here is something that you've already seen. It's the standard magnetization transfer through the J-coupling. It's the inept experiment. Remember how we had designed it when we dealt with the product operator formalism. So pi by 2 and pi and pi by 2 with appropriate phases. I will not go into the detail. And this here is 1 over 4 j. When we analyzed that, this simply just moved the magnetization from proton to nitrogen. Remember the lengthy exercise in trigonometry that I've put on the board in that lecture. And then at the end we have said, well, what about the chemical shift evolution? And we had to put these refocusing pulses in the middle to also refocus the chemical shift evolution. So the only thing this does is it just moves the proton magnetization to nitrogen. And that's all there is. And then we evolve for a period tau, so here, and only on the nitrogen, and we would like there to be no effect of the J-coupling to the proton, and so we put a pi pulse on the proton to refocus everything pertaining to proton, so this entire tau period, this is essentially just evolution under omega. N. And then we do the direct reverse of this. So we put two 90 degree pulses here. And then we wait for another 1 over 4j. And then we put the pi pulse here and the pi pulse there. We wait for another period and, uh, of exactly the same length. And we record, so that's the T2. Uh, and that, let's call it T1, although it's called tau in your handout. So that's the T2 period. And we turn on the decoupling here. So the advantage of this pulse sequence, although it's a bit more complicated, the multiplet patterns are significantly simplified. And you will learn, if you go professionally into magnetic resonance, to just visually recognize these magnetization transfer blocks. So literally, we took 1H, moved it to nitrogen, evolved it on the nitrogen for T1 with this frequency, moved it back on the proton, evolved it on the proton with the frequency omega H for T2. The result is exactly the same mathematics as what we have seen here, but with significantly simplified multiplets. And you can see in figure eight, in your handout, I've included a proton nitrogen HSQC of ubiquitin. You can see very pretty round peaks there. And an awful lot of them, right? Many dozens. And of course, individually, a proton spectrum of this and the nitrogen spectrum of this would have been completely uninformative. Now, there are two things here. One is, well, nitrogen has a terrible natural abundance and very low magnetogyric ratio. So the spectrum that you have in figure 8 was recorded for isotopically enriched ubiquitin. So we fed bacteria with N15 ammonia and urea, 
and they've just happily incorporated N15. So we had a heavy bacterium that made that protein for us. And secondly, the experiment um, both here and here does a strange thing. Of course, we could have simply started on the nitrogen. Right? We could have begun here and simply put a 90 on the nitrogen and told it to evolve for a while and then moved it to proteins and recorded. Why are we going through the trouble of starting on the proteins and moving to the nitrogens and evolving and moving back? This is because there's 10 times more magnetization on the protons because of the 10 times greater magnetic ratio. So it actually pays to go to push this large amount of magnetization to the nitrogen rather than use the natural amount that the nitrogen has. The second thing, of course, is we could have done the experiment in reverse. We could have recorded the T2 evolution on the protons here, done just one transfer to the nitrogen and recorded the nitrogen. And that is not done because the sensitivity of NMI detection is also proportional to frequency. The greater the frequency, the greater the sensitivity. And so A, there's more proton magnetization to start with here, and so it helps if we begin here and just reuse it. And secondly, it helps if we can detect on the protons because 10 times greater frequency um, has um, 10 times greater sensitivity and also better electromagnetic behavior of the various resonant circuits, fewer problems with ringing, fewer problems with tuning. So normally such experiments begin on protons, move stuff around and then end on protons as well. All right, so these are heteronuclear correlation experiments. Now, what about homonuclear? The biggest complication there is J-coupling is no longer weak. So item three on the agenda, cozy and nosy experiments. These are both homonuclear, that is, they move magnetization, not between, say, proton and nitrogen, but between proton and some other proton. Funnily enough, the sequences are simpler than what I've just shown you for the heteronuclear case, but the spin dynamics within them is more complicated. So let us start with cozy. Just one channel here, one H. We do a 19 pi by 2, we evolve for a period t1, we do another 90, and we evolve for a period t2, and that's all there is. Exactly the same principle, however, the intermediate dynamics here includes strong j-couplings. Remember what I told you in the product operator formalism lecture, even though it technically speaking can be used to treat strong J couplings, the mathematics and trigonometry becomes horrendous. And so we focused on weak J couplings just to illustrate. So I will not go through the product operator formalism treatment here. It stands to reason that more or less after the dust has settled, this sequence does broadly the same thing as those did for the heteronuclear case, just we have homonuclear uh, transfers. The complexity can be seen in the handout. So I've plotted in figure 10 the cozy spectrum of rotenone. It's an industrial uh, herbicide, I think, or insecticide. And you can see that the multiplicity patterns are significantly more complicated than the ones that you've seen in the HSQC. The, the diagonal contains antiphase peaks, they go from positive to negative, and the cross peaks have complicated structure. This is the consequence of those J couplings. Um, and in particular the flip-flop terms in the homonuclear case. So we are not going through the details of what is happening there. We simply just note that more or less it's the same thing. So this is cozy. Correlation spectroscopy. Nosy we would need to discuss in slightly more detail, although also only qualitatively. 
imagine that we want our transport to happen not under the J couplings but under the nuclear overhauser effect. So we want cross relaxation to happen through space. And this would be super useful because a lot of molecules in chemistry do contain proximate protons that are not J coupled. If you have a folded protein, you can have amino acid number one sitting right next to amino acid number 50. And you'd really love to know that they're sitting next to one another, except there's no J coupling. Okay, what do we do? We do exactly the same game. So we have a pi by 2 uh, like that. Then we wait for a period T1 just like we did um, above. So another pulse. But then what we do is we, after this pulse, instead of detecting we destroy all transverse magnetization and this is most conveniently accomplished by a gradient pulse and thankfully you now did a little bit of MRI you remember what a gradient does it creates a spiral of the transverse magnetization through the sample Spiral meaning that if you detect the overall magnetization in the sample, it's pretty much zero because all directions in the spiral average out. So if we do a gradient pulse here, we are going to destroy all transverse magnetization. Only the longitudinal magnetization will be kept. But of course, longitudinal magnetization is immune to J coupling. Well, to weak J coupling, certainly, and to strong J coupling, approximately. So it'll just be sitting there as a longitudinal magnetization and not doing much. Except if there is overhauser effect. As you know, overhauser effect in a two spin system can make longitudinal magnetization between two spins L and S exchange. And we give it some time, and that's called mixing time. And then we simply just detect. So the final 90 degrees here, pi by 2, and then detection. So in this case, what is going to happen is we are going to have our protons evolve under a period T1 with some frequency omega 1. Then we move the magnetization, but not through bonds, but through space, to some other proton nearby. And then we excite that proton, because of course it arrives longitudinal, so we do a 90 on that proton, and it evolves with the frequency omega 2 for a time t2. So once again we have accomplished what we wanted in this sense. But now the presence of a cross peak at the intersection of two frequencies would indicate not J coupling but spatial proximity. And for that reason, uh, this 2D is called nuclear overhauser effect spectroscopy. And you have a nosy spectrum in your handout uh, in figure 12. Uh, this is probably one of the highest quality NMR spectra I have ever seen. Uh, this was recorded in a gigahertz instrument on Ubiquitin and I think that has taken at least a week to record. But you can see there the number of cross peaks is in the thousands. And you have every proton there, so the diagonal is um, more or less the standard NMR spectrum, and every single little peak in this spectrum corresponds to a distance. Not only that, but of course remember that this transfer efficiency was proportional to 1 over r to the 6, and so the intensity, uh, essentially just the volume, of every one of those cross peaks is a function of distance. So that one spectrum contains a phenomenal amount of information about the molecule. Not only just the chemical shifts, which tell us roughly which functional group it is, but a few thousand distances between the 
atoms there. And this is how protein structure determination is done. So people first run HSQC and HMQC type experiments and we will go through those particular ones in the next lecture. They involve carbon as well as nitrogen to trace out the J-coupling connectivity and therefore the amino acid sequence. And that gives you the sequence of amino acids in the protein. Uh, or rather assigns the peaks because the sequence might actually be known uh, from just uh, you know sequencing uh, chemically then we know which peak is which then we run a nosy and then we know which atom is proximate to which atom and then it's a giant constrained molecular dynamics simulation typically just annealing and optimization subject to those distance restraints that folds the protein in three dimensions and this is how all the protein structures that you see in the pdb database have been determined a collection of two-dimensional and three-dimensional, that's the topic of the next lecture, followed by a nosy type experiment, followed by a constrained molecular dynamics optimization that gets you the structure. Pretty laborious, but in many cases no other choice, because a lot of very stubborn proteins simply wouldn't crystallize. And so it's not possible to determine the structure in any other way. Okay, the summary of the lecture, if we just had a few more time coordinates in the universe, things would have been a lot easier, but we don't, and so we need to make use of the one time coordinate we are given repeatedly. And we just increment the indirect time dimension every time we repeat the experiment, and we do get the matrix corresponding to there being two time dimensions anyway. A two-dimensional Fourier transform gives us a collection of peaks at intersections of the various frequencies. And if we take advantage of the fact that magnetization can be moved through J-couplings, then the cross peaks will appear between the frequencies of the spins that are J-coupled. If we take advantage of the Overhauser effect transfer, then the cross peaks will appear between proximate peaks. So uh, two Nobel Prizes have been awarded for this business. There are thousands of pulse sequences and books this sick have been written on the subject, but that is the simplest exposition I could think of of the subject. Any questions?